This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit www.librivox.org. The Last Days of Pompeii by Edward George Bulwer Lytton. Book the Fifth. Chapter One. The Dream of Arbacus, a Visitor and a Warning to the Egyptian. The awful night preceding the fierce joy of the amphitheatre rolled drearily away, and greyly broke forth the dawn of the last day of Pompeii. The air was uncommonly calm and sultry. A thin and dull mist gathered over the valleys and hollows of the broad companion fields. But yet it was remarked in surprise by the early fishermen that, despite the exceeding stillness of the atmosphere, the waves of the sea were agitated, and seemed, as it were, to run disturbedly back from the shore, while along the blue and stately Sarnus, whose ancient breadth of channel the traveller now vainly seeks to discover, there crept a hoarse and sullen murmur, as it glided by the laughing plains and the gaudy villas of the wealthy citizens. Clear above the low mist rose the time-worn towers of the immemorial town, the red-tiled roofs of the bright streets, the solemn columns of many temples, and the statue-crowned portals of the Forum and the Arch of Triumph. Far in the distance the outline of the circling hills soared above the vapours and mingled with the changeful hues of the morning sky. The cloud that had so long rested over the crest of Vesuvius had suddenly vanished, and its rugged and haughty brow looked without a frown over the beautiful scenes below. Despite the earliness of the hour, the gates of the city were already opened. Horsemen upon horsemen, vehicle after vehicle, poured rapidly in, and the voices of numerous pedestrian groups, clad in holiday attire, rose high in joyous and excited merriment. The streets were crowded with citizens and strangers from the populous neighborhood of Pompeii, and noisily, fast, confusedly, swept the many streams of life towards the fatal show. Despite the vast size of the amphitheatre, seemingly so disproportioned to the extent of the city, and formed to include nearly the whole population of Pompeii itself, so great, on extraordinary occasions, was the concourse of strangers from all parts of Campania, that the space before it was usually crowded for several hours previous to the commencement of the sports by such persons as were not entitled by their rank to appointed and special seats. And the intense curiosity which the trial and sentence of two criminals so remarkable has occasioned, increased the crowd on this day to an extent wholly unprecedented. While the common people, with the lively vehemence of their companion blood, were thus pushing, scrambling, hurrying on, yet, amidst all their eagerness, preserving, as is now the wont with Italians in such meetings, a wonderful order and unquarrelsome good humour, a strange visitor to Arbacus was threading her way to his sequestered mansion. At the sight of her quaint and primeval garb, of her wild gait and gestures, the passengers she encountered touch each other and smiled. But as they caught a glimpse of her countenance, the mirth was hushed at once, for the face was as the face of the dead. And what were the ghastly features and obsolete robes of the stranger, it seemed as if one long entombed had risen once more amongst the living. In silence and awe, each group gave way as she passed along, and she soon gained the broad porch of the Egyptian's palace. The black porter, like the rest of the world, astir at an unusual hour, started as he opened the door to her summons. The sleep of the Egyptian had been usually profound during the night, but as the dawn approached it was disturbed by strange and unquiet dreams which impressed him the more as they were coloured by the peculiar philosophy he embraced. He thought that he was transported to the bowels of the earth, 
and that he stood alone in a mighty cavern, supported by enormous columns of rough and primeval rock, lost as they ascended in the vastness of a shadow, athwart whose eternal darkness no beam of day had ever glanced. And in the space between these columns were huge wheels that whirled round and round unceasingly and with a rushing and roaring noise. Only to the right and left extremities of the cavern the space between the pillars was left bare, and the apertures stretched away into galleries, not wholly dark, but dimly lighted by wandering and erratic fires, that, meteor-like, now crept, as the snake creeps, along the rugged, dank soil, and now leaped fiercely to and fro, darting across the vast gloom in wild gambols, suddenly disappearing, and as suddenly bursting into tenfold brilliancy and power. And while he gazed wonderingly upon the gallery to the left, thin, mist-like, aerial shapes passed slowly up. And when they had gained the hall, they seemed to rise aloft and to vanish, as the smoke vanishes in the measureless ascent. He turned in fear towards the opposite extremity, and behold, there came swiftly from the gloom above similar shadows, which swept hurriedly along the gallery to the right, as if borne involuntarily adown the sides of some invisible stream, and the faces of these spectres were more distinct than those that emerged from the opposite passage, and on some was joy, and on others sorrow. Some were vivid with expectation and hope, some unutterably dejected by awe and horror. And so they passed, swift and constantly on, till the eyes of the gazer grew dizzy and blinded with the whirl of a never-varying succession of things, impelled by a power apparently not their own. Arbarchus turned away, and in the recess of the hall he saw the mighty form of a giantess, seated upon a pile of skulls, and her hands were busy upon a pale and shadowy woof and he saw that the woof communicated with the numberless wheels, as if it guided the machinery of their movements. He thought his feet, by some secret agency, were impelled towards the female, and that he was borne onwards, till he stood before her face to face. The countenance of the giantess was solemn and hushed, and beautifully serene. It was as the face of some colossal sculpture of his own ancestral sphinx. No passion, no human emotion, disturbed its brooding and unwrinkled brow. There was neither sadness, nor joy, nor memory, nor hope. It was free from all with which the wild human heart can sympathize. The mystery of mysteries rested on its beauty. It awed, but terrified not. It was the incarnation of the sublime. And Abarchus felt the voice leave his lips without an impulse of his own. And the voice asked, Who art thou, and what is thy task? I am that which thou hast acknowledged, answered without desisting from its work the mighty phantom. My name is Nature. These are the wheels of the world, and my hand guides them for the life of all things. And what? said the voice of Abarchus. Are these galleries, that strangely and fitfully illumined, stretch on either hand into the abyss of gloom? That, answered the giant mother, which thou beholdest to the left, is the gallery of the unborn. The shadows that flit onward and upward into the world are the souls that pass from the long eternity of being to their destined pilgrimage on earth. That, which thou beholdest to thy right, wherein the shadows descending from above sweep on, equally unknown and dim, is the gallery of the dead. And wherefore, said the voice of Arbacus, yon wandering lights that so wildly break the darkness, but only break, not reveal. Dark fool of the human sciences, dreamer of the stars, and would-be decipher of the heart and origin of things, those lights are but the glimmerings of such knowledge as is vouchsafed to nature to work her way, to trace enough of the past and future to give providence to her designs. Judge then, puppet of thou art, what lights are reserved for thee. Arbacus felt himself tremble as he asked again, Wherefore am I here? 
It is the forecast of thy soul, the prescience of thy Russian doom, the shadow of thy fate, lengthening into eternity as declines from earth. Ere he could answer, Abarcus felt a rushing wind sweep down the cavern as the winds of a giant god. Borne aloft from the ground and whirled on high as a leaf in the storms of autumn, he beheld himself in the midst of the spectres of the dead, and hurrying with them along the length of gloom. As in vain and impotent despair he struggled against the impelling power, he thought the wind grew into something like a shape, a spectral outline of the wings and talons of an eagle, with limbs floating far and indistinctly along the air, and eyes that, alone clearly and vividly seen, glared stonily and remorselessly on his own. What art thou? Again said the voice of the Egyptian. I am that which thou hast acknowledged. And the spectre laughed aloud. And my name is Necessity. To what dost thou bear me? To the unknown. To happiness or to woe? As thou hast sown, so shalt thou reap. Dread thing, not so. If thou art the ruler of life, thine are my misdeeds, not mine. I am but the breath of God answered the mighty wind. Then is my wisdom vain? groaned the dreamer. The husbandman accuses not fate, when having sown thistles, he reaps not corn. Thou hast sown crime, accuse not fate, if thou reapest not the harvest of virtue. The scene suddenly changed. Abarcus was in a place of human bones, and lo, in the midst of them was a skull, and the skull, still retaining its fleshless hollows, assumed slowly, and in the mysterious confusion of a dream, the face of Apicidus. And forth from the grinning jaws there crept a small worm, and it crawled to the feet of Abarcus. He attempted to stamp on it and to crush it, but it became longer and larger with that attempt. It swelled and bloated till it grew into a vast serpent. It coiled itself round the limbs of Arbacus. It crunched his bones. It raised its glaring eyes and poisonous jaws to his face. He writhed in vain. He withered. He gasped beneath the influence of the blighting breath. He felt himself blasted into death. And then a voice came from the reptile, which still bore the face of Apicidus, and rang in his reeling ear. Thy victim is thy judge. The worm thou wouldst crush becomes the serpent that devours thee. With a shriek of wrath and woe and despairing resistance, Arbacus awoke, his hair on end, his brow bathed in dew, his eyes glazed and staring his mighty frame quivering as an infant's beneath the agony of that dream. He awoke, he collected himself, he blessed the gods whom he disbelieved that he was in a dream. He turned his eyes from side to side, he saw the dawning light break through his small but lofty window. He was in the precincts of day, he rejoiced, he smiled, his eyes fell, and opposite to him he beheld the ghastly features, the lifeless eye, the livid lip of the hag of Vesuvius. Ha! Ah, he cried, placing his hands before his eyes as to shut out the grisly vision. Do I dream still? Am I with the dead? Mighty Hermes, no. Thou art with one death-like, but not dead. Recognize thy friend and slave. There was a long silence. Slowly the shudders that passed over the limbs of the Egyptian chased each other away, faintly and faintly dying, till he was himself again. It was a dream then, said he. Well, let me dream no more, or the day cannot compensate for the pangs of night. Woman, how camest thou here, and wherefore? I came to warn thee, answered the sepulchral voice of the saga. Warn me? The dream lied not, then. Of what peril? Listen to me. 
Some evil hangs over this fated city. Fly while it be time. Thou knowest that I hold my home on that mountain beneath which old tradition saith there yet burn the fires of the river of Phlegerton, and in my cavern is a vast abyss, and in that abyss I have of late marked a red and dull stream creep slowly, slowly on, and heard many and many sounds hissing and roaring through the gloom. But last night, as I looked thereon, behold, the stream was no longer dull, but immensely and fiercely luminous. And while I gazed, the beast that liveth with me, and was covering by my side, uttered a shrill howl, and fell down, and died, and the slaver and froth were round his lips. I crept back to my lair, but I distinctly heard all the night the rock shake and tremble, and though the air was heavy and still, there were the hissing of pent winds, and the griding as of wheels beneath the ground. So when I rose this morning, at the very birth of dawn, I looked again down the abyss, and saw vast fragments of stone borne black and floatingly over the lurid stream. And the stream itself was broader, fiercer, redder than the night before. Then I went forth and ascended the summit of the rock. And in that summit there appeared a sudden and vast hollow which I had never perceived before, from which curled a dim, faint smoke. And the vapor was deathly, and I gasped and sickened and nearly died. I returned home. I took my gold and my drugs and left the habitation of many years. For I remember the dark Etruscan prophecy which saith, When the mountain opens, the city shall fall. When the smoke crowns the hill of the parched fields, there shall be woe and weeping in the hearths of the children of the sea. Dread master, ere I leave these walls for some more distant dwelling, I come to thee, as thou livest, know I in my heart that the earthquake that sixteen years ago shook the city to its solid base was but the forerunner of more deadly doom. The walls of Pompeii are built above the fields of the dead and the rivers of the sleepless hell. Be warned and fly. Which I thank thee for thy care of one not ungrateful. On yon table stands a cup of gold, take it, it is thine. I dreamt not that there lived one out of the priesthood of Isis who would have saved Arbacus from destruction. The signs that thou hast seen in the bed of the extinct volcano, continued the Egyptian musingly, surely tell of some coming danger to the city, perhaps another earthquake, fiercer than the last. Be that as it may, there is a new reason for my hastening from these walls. After this day, I will prepare my departure. Daughter of Etruria, whither wendest thou? I shall cross over to Herculaneum this day, and, wandering thence along the coast, shall seek out a new home. I am friendless. My two companions, the fox and the snake, are dead. Great Hermes, thou hast promised me twenty additional years of life. I, said the Egyptian, I have promised thee. But woman, he added, lifting himself upon his arm and gazing curiously on her face, tell me, I pray thee, wherefore thou wishest to live? What sweets dost thou discover in existence? It is not life that is sweet, 
but death, that is awful, replied the hag in a sharp, impressive tone that struck forcibly upon the heart of the vain starseer. He winced at the truth of the reply, and no longer anxious to retain so uninviting a companion, he said, Time wanes. I must prepare for the solemn spectacle of this day. Sister, farewell. Enjoy thyself as thou canst over the ashes of life. The hag, who had placed the costly gift of Arbacus in the loose folds of her vest, now rose to depart. When she had gained the door, she paused, turned back, and said, This may be the last time we meet on earth. But whither flieth the flame when it leaves the ashes, wandering to and fro, up and down, as an exhalation on the morass? The flame may be seen in the marshes of the lake below, and the witch and the magian, the pupil and the master, the great one and the accursed one, may meet again. Farewell. Out, Croker muttered Arbacus, as the door closed on the hag's tattered robes, and, impatient of his own thoughts, not yet recovered from the past dream, he hastily summoned his slaves. It was the custom to attend the ceremonials of the amphitheatre in festive robes, and Arbacus arrayed himself that day with more than usual care. His tunic was of the most dazzling white. His many fibulae were formed from the most precious stones. Over his tunic flowed a loose eastern robe, half gown, half mantle, glowing in the richest hues of the Tyrian dye, and the sandals that reached halfway up his knee were studded with gems and inlaid with gold. In the quackeries that belonged to his priestly genius, Arbacus never neglected, on great occasions, the arts which dazzle and impose upon the vulgar, and on this day that was forever to release him by the sacrifice of Glaucus from the fear of a rival and the chance of detection, he felt that he was arraying himself as for a triumph or a nuptial feast. It was customary for men of rank to be accompanied to the shows of the amphitheatre by a procession of their slaves and freedmen, and the long family of Arbacus were already arranged in order to attend to the litter of their lord. Only to their great chagrin the slaves in attendance on Ione and the worthy Socia, as jailer to Nidia, were condemned to remain at home. Callus, said Arbacus apart to his freedman, who was buckling on his girdle, I am weary of Pompeii. I propose to quit it in three days, should the wind favour. Thou knowest the vessel that lies in the harbour which belonged to Narses of Alexandria. I have purchased it of him. The day after tomorrow we shall begin to remove my stores. So soon, tis well, our Bacchus shall be obeyed, and his ward, Ione, accompanies me. Enough. Is the morning fair? Dim and oppressive. It will probably be intensely hot in the forenoon. The poor gladiators, and more wretched criminals, descend and see that the slaves are marshalled. Left alone, Abarcus stepped in his chamber of study, and thence upon the portico without. He saw the dense masses of men pouring fast into the amphitheatre, and heard the cry of the assistants and the cracking of the cordage, as they were straining aloft the huge awning under which the citizens, molested by no discomforting ray, were to behold, at luxurious ease, the agonies of their fellow creatures. Suddenly a wild strange sound went forth, and as suddenly died away. It was the roar of the lion. There was a silence in the distant crowd, but the silence was followed by joyous laughter, they were making merry at the hungry impatience of the royal beast. "'Brutes!' muttered the disdainful Abacus. "'Are ye less homicides than I am? I slay, but in self-defence ye make murder past time.' He turned with a restless and curious eye towards Vesuvius. Beautifully glow the green vineyards round its breast, and tranquil as eternity, lay in the breathless skies the form of the mighty hill. "'We have time yet, if the earthquake be nursing,' thought Abacus, and he turned from the spot. 
He passed by the table which bore his mystic scrolls and Chaldean calculations. August art, he thought. I have not consulted thy decrees since I passed the danger and the crisis they foretold. What matter? I know that henceforth all in my path is bright and smooth. Have not events already proved it? Away doubt, away pity. Reflect, O oh my heart, reflect for the future, but two images, Empire and Ione. End of Chapter 1 in Book 5 of The Last Days of Pompeii by Edward George Bulwer Lytton Two of Last Days of Pompeii this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book 5, Chapter 2. The Amphitheater. Nydia, assured by the account of Sosia on his return home, and satisfied that her letter was in the hands of Salust, gave herself up once more to hope. Salust would surely lose no time in seeking the Praetor, in coming to the house of the Egyptian, in releasing her, in breaking the prison of Calanus. That very night Glaucus would be free. Alas, the night passed, the dawn broke. She heard nothing but the hurried footsteps of the slaves along the hall in Peristyle, and their voices in preparation for the show. By and by, the commanding voice of Arbaces broke on her ear. A flourish of music rung out cheerily. The long procession were sweeping to the amphitheatre to glut their eyes on the death pangs of the Athenian. The procession of Arbaces moved along slowly and with much solemnity till now, arriving at the palace where it was necessary for such as came in litters or chariots to alight, Arbaces descended from his vehicle and proceeded to the entrance by which the more distinguished spectators were admitted. His slaves, mingling with the humbler crowd, were stationed by officers who received their tickets, not much unlike our modern opera ones, in places in the popularia, the seats apportioned to the vulgar. And now, from the spot where Arbaces sat, his eyes scanned the mighty and impatient crowd that filled the stupendous theatre. On the upper tier, but apart from the male spectators, sat women, their gay dresses resembling some gaudy flower-bed. It is needless to add that they were the most talkative part of the assembly, and many were the looks directed up to them, especially from the benches appropriated to the young and unmarried men. On the lower seats round the arena sat the more high-born and wealthy visitors, the magistrates and those of senatorial or equestrian dignity, the passages which, by corridors at the right and left, gave access to these seats at either end of the oval arena were also the entrances for the combatants. Strong palings at these passages prevented any unwelcome eccentricity in the movements of the beasts and confined them to their appointed prey. Around the parapet which was raised above the arena and from which the seats gradually rose were gladiatorial inscriptions and paintings wrought in fresco, typical of the entertainments for which the place was designed. Throughout the whole building wound invisible pipes, from which, as the day advanced, cooling and fragrant showers were to be sprinkled over the spectators. The officers of the amphitheatre were still employed in the task of fixing the vast awning, or velaria, which covered the whole, and which luxurious invention the companions arrogated to themselves. It was woven of the whitest Apulian wool, and variegated with broad stripes of crimson. Owing either to some inexperience on the part of the workmen, or to some defect in the machinery, the awning, however, was not arranged that day so happily as usual. Indeed, from the immense space of the circumference, the task was always one of great difficulty and art, so much so that it could seldom be adventured in rough or windy weather. But the present day was so remarkably still, that there seemed to the spectators no excuse for the awkwardness of the artificers, and when a large gap in the back of the awning was still visible, 
from the obstinate refusal of one part of the Valeria to ally itself with the rest, the murmurs of discontent were loud and general. The ideale Panza, at whose expense the exhibition was given, looked particularly annoyed at the defect, and vowed bitter vengeance on the head of the chief officer of the show, who, fretting, puffing, perspiring, busied himself in idle orders and unavailing threats. The hubbub ceased suddenly, the operators desisted, the crowd were stilled, the gap was forgotten, for now, with a loud and warlike flourish of trumpets, the gladiators, marshalled in ceremonious procession, entered the arena. They swept round the oval space very slowly and deliberately, in order to give the spectators full leisure to admire their stern serenity of feature, their brawny limbs and various arms, as well as to form such wagers as the excitement of the moment might suggest. "'Oh!' cried the widow Fulvia to the wife of Panza, as they leaned down from their lofty bench, "'Do you see that gigantic gladiator? How drolly he is dressed!' "'Yes,' said the Idile's wife, with complacent importance, for she knew all the names and qualities of each combatant. He is a retarius or netter. He is armed only, you see, with a three-pronged spear like a trident and a net. He wears no armor, only the fillet and the tunic. He is a mighty man and is to fight with Sporus, yon thick-set gladiator with the round shield and drawn sword, but without body armor. He has not his helmet on now, in order that you may see his face, how fearless it is! By and by he will fight with his visor down. But surely a net and spear are poor arms against a shield and sword? That shows how innocent you are, my dear Fulvia. The Retarius has generally the best of it. But who is yon handsome gladiator, nearly naked? Is it not quite improper? By Venus, but his limbs are beautifully shaped. It is Leiden, a young untried man. He has the rashness to fight yon other gladiator similarly dressed, or rather undressed, tetraides. They fight first in the Greek fashion with the cestus. Afterwards they put on armor and try sword and shield. He is a proper man, this Leiden, and the women, I am sure, are on his side. So are not the experienced betters. Clodius offers three to one against him. "'Oh, Jove, how beautiful!' exclaimed the widow, as two gladiators, armed cap a pied, rode round the arena on light and prancing steeds. Resembling much the combatants in the tilts of the Middle Age, they bore lances and round shields beautifully inlaid. Their armor was woven intricately with bands of iron, but it covered only the thighs and the right arms. Short cloaks, extending to the seat, gave a picturesque and graceful air to their costume. Their legs were naked, with the exception of sandals, which were fastened a little above the ankle. "'Oh, beautiful! Who are these?' asked the widow. "'The one is named Burbix. He has conquered twelve times. The other assumes the arrogant name of Nobilior. They are both Gauls.' While thus conversing, the first formalities of the show were over. To these succeeded a feigned combat with wooden swords, between the various gladiators matched against each other. Amongst these, the skill of two Roman gladiators, hired for the occasion, was the most admired, and next to them the most graceful combatant was Leiden. This sham contest did not last above an hour, nor did it attract any very lively interest, except among those connoisseurs of the arena to whom art was preferable to more coarse excitement. The body of the spectators were rejoiced when it was over, and when the sympathy rose to terror. The combatants were now arranged in pairs, as agreed beforehand, their weapons examined, and the grave sports of the day commenced amidst the deepest silence, broken only by an exciting and preliminary blast of warlike music. It was often customary to begin the sports by the most cruel of all, and some bestiarius, or gladiator appointed to the beasts, was slain first, as an initiatory sacrifice. But in the present instance, the experienced Panza thought it better that the sanguinary drama should advance, not decrease, in interest, and accordingly, 
the execution of Olynthus and Glaucus was reserved for the last. It was arranged that the two horsemen should first occupy the arena, that the foot gladiators, paired off, should then be loosed indiscriminately on the stage, that Glaucus and the lion should next perform their part in the bloody spectacle, and the tiger and the Nazarene be the grand finale. And in the spectacles of Pompeii, the reader of Roman history must limit his imagination, nor expect to find those vast and wholesale exhibitions of magnificent slaughter with which a Nero or a Caligula regaled the inhabitants of the imperial city. The Roman shows, which absorbed the more celebrated gladiators, and the chief portion of foreign beasts, were indeed the very reason why, in the lesser towns of the empire, the sports of the amphitheatre were comparatively humane and rare, and in this, as in other respects, Pompeii was but the miniature, the microcosm of Rome. Still, it was an awful and imposing spectacle, with which modern times have, happily, nothing to compare. A vast theatre, rising row upon row, and swarming with human beings, from fifteen to eighteen thousand in number, intent upon no fictitious representation, no tragedy of the stage, but an actual victory or defeat, the exultant life or the bloody death, of each and all who entered the arena. The two horsemen were now at either extremity of the lists, if so they might be called, and, at a given signal from Panza, the combatants started simultaneously as in full collision, each advancing his round buckler, each poising on high his light yet sturdy javelin. But just when within three paces of his opponent, the steed of Burbix suddenly halted, wheeled round, and, as Nobilior was borne rapidly by, his antagonist spurred upon him. The buckler of Nobilior, quickly and skillfully extended, received a blow which otherwise would have been fatal. "'Well done, Nobilior!' cried the praetor, giving the first vent to the popular excitement. "'Bravely struck, my Burbix!' answered Clodius from his seat. And the wild murmur, swelled by many a shout, echoed from side to side. The visors of both the horsemen were completely closed, like those of the knights in after-times, but the head was, nevertheless, the great point of assault, and Nobilior, now wheeling his charger with no less adroitness than his opponent, directed his spear full on the helmet of his foe. Burbix raised his buckler to shield himself, and his quick-eyed antagonist, suddenly lowering his weapon, pierced him through the breast. Burbix reeled and fell. Nobilior! Nobilior! shouted the populace. I have lost ten sesterdia, said Clodius between his teeth. Habit! He has it, said Panza deliberately. The populace, not yet hardened into cruelty, made the signal of mercy. But as the attendants of the arena approached, they found the kindness came too late. The heart of the Gaul had been pierced, and his eyes were set in death. It was his life's blood that flowed so darkly over the sand and sawdust of the arena. "'It is a pity it was so soon over. There was little enough for one's trouble,' said the widow Falvia. "'Yes, I have no compassion for Burbix. Any one might have seen that Nobilior did but faint. Mark, they fix the fatal hook to the body. They drag him away to the spoliarium. They scatter new sand over the stage.' Panza regrets nothing more than that he is not rich enough to strew the arena with borax and cinnabar, as Nero used to do. Well, if it had been a brief battle, it is quickly succeeded. See my handsome Leiden in the arena, I and the net-bearer too, and the swordsmen. Oh, charming! There were now on the arena six combatants, Niger and his net, matched against Sporus with his shield and his short broadsword, Lydon and Tetraides, naked save by a cincture round the waist, each armed only with a heavy Greek cestus, and two gladiators from Rome, clad in complete steel, and evenly matched with immense bucklers and pointed swords. The initiatory contest between Lydon and Tetraides being less deadly than that between the other combatants, no sooner had they advanced to the middle of the arena than, as by common assent, the rest held back to see how that contest should be decided, and wait till fiercer weapons might replace the cestus, 
ere they themselves commenced hostilities. They stood leaning on their arms, and apart from each other, gazing on the show, which, if not bloody enough thoroughly to please the populace, they were still inclined to admire, because its origin was of their ancestral Greece. No person could, at first glance, have seemed less evenly matched than the two antagonists. Tetraides, though not taller than Leiden, weighed considerably more. The natural size of his muscles was increased, to the eyes of the vulgar, by masses of solid flesh. For, as it was a notion that the contest of the Cestus fared easiest with him who was plumpest, Tetraides had encouraged to the utmost his hereditary predisposition to the portly. His shoulders were vast, and his lower limbs thick-set, double-jointed, and slightly curved outward, in that formation which takes so much from beauty to give so largely to strength. But Leiden, except that he was slender even almost to meagerness, was beautifully and delicately proportioned, and the skilful might have perceived that, with much less compass of muscle than his foe, that which he had was more seasoned, iron and compact. In proportion, too, as he wanted flesh, he was likely to possess activity, and a haughty smile on his resolute face, which strongly contrasted the solid heaviness of his enemies, gave assurance to those who beheld it, and united their hope to their pity, so that, despite the disparity of their seeming strength, the cry of the multitude was nearly as loud for Leiden as for Tetraides. Whoever is acquainted with modern prize ring, whoever has witnessed the heavy and disabling strokes which the human fist, skillfully directed, hath the power to bestow, may easily understand how much that happy facility would be increased by a band carried by thongs of leather round the arm as high as the elbow, and terribly strengthened about the knuckles by a plate of iron, and sometimes a plummet of lead. Yet this, which was meant to increase, perhaps rather diminished the interest of the fray, for it necessarily shortened its duration. A very few blows, successfully and scientifically planted, might suffice to bring the contest to a close, and the battle did not, therefore, often allow full scope for the energy, fortitude, and dogged perseverance that we technically style pluck, which not unusually wins the day against superior science, and which heightens to so painful a delight the interest in the battle and the sympathy for the brave. Guard thyself, growled Tetraides, moving nearer and nearer to his foe, who rather shifted round him than receded. Leiden did not answer, save by a scornful glance of his quick, vigilant eye. Tetraides struck. It was the blow of a smith on a vice. Leiden sank suddenly on one knee. The blow passed over his head. Not so harmless was Leiden's retaliation. He quickly sprung to his feet, and aimed his cestus full on the broad chest of his antagonist. Tetraides reeled. The populace shouted. "'You are unlucky today,' said Lepidus to Clodius. "'You have lost one bet. You will lose another.' "'By the gods! My bronzes go to the auctioneer if that is the case. I have no less than a hundred sesterdia upon Tetraides.' Ha, ha, see how he rallies. That was a home stroke. He has cut open Leiden's shoulder. A tetraides, a tetraides. But Leiden is not disheartened. By Pollux, how well he keeps his temper. See how dexterously he avoids those hammer-like hands, dodging now here, now there, circling round and round. Ah, poor Leiden, he has it again. Three to one still on Tetraides. What say you, Lepidus? Well, nine sesterdia to three, be it so. What, again, Leiden? He stops, he gasps for breath. By the gods he is down. No, he is again on his legs. Brave Leiden, Tetraides is encouraged. He laughs loud, he rushes on him. Fool, success blinds him. He should be cautious. Leiden's eye is like the lynx's said Clodius between his teeth. Ha, Clodius, you saw that? Your man totters. Another blow. He falls, he falls. Earth revives him then. He is once more up, but the blood rolls down his face. By the thunderer, Leiden wins it. See how he presses on him. 
That blow on the temple would have crushed an ox. It has crushed Tetraides. He falls again. He cannot move. Habit, habit. Habit, repeated Panza. Take them out and give them the armor and swords. Noble editor, said the officers, we fear that Tetraides will not recover in time. How be it, we will try. Do so. In a few minutes the officers, who had dragged off the stunned and insensible gladiator, returned with rueful countenances. They feared for his life. He was utterly incapacitated from re-entering the arena. In that case, said Panza, hold Leiden a subditious, and the first gladiator that is vanquished, let Leiden supply his place with the victor. The people shouted their applause at this sentence. Then they again sunk into deep silence. The trumpet sounded loudly. The four combatants stood each against each in prepared and stern array. Dost thou recognize the Romans, my Clodius? Are they among the celebrated, or are they merely ordinary? Eumolpus is a good second-rate swordsman, my Lepidus. Nepimus, the lesser man, I have never seen before. But he is the son of one of the imperial fiscales, and brought up in a proper school. Doubtless they will show sport, but I have no heart for the game. I cannot win back my money. I am undone. Curses on that Leiden! Who could have supposed he was so dexterous or so lucky? Well, Clodius, shall I take compassion on you and accept your own terms with these Romans? And even ten sesterdia on Eumolpus, then? What, when Nepimus is untried? Nay, nay, that is too bad. Well, ten to eight? Agreed. While the contest in the amphitheatre had thus commenced, there was one in the loftier benches for whom it had assumed, indeed, a poignant and stifling interest. The aged father of Leiden, despite his Christian horror of the spectacle, in his agonized anxiety for his son, had not been able to resist being the spectator of his fate. One amidst a fierce crowd of strangers, the lowest rabble of the populace, the old man saw, felt nothing, but the form, the presence of his brave son. Not a sound had escaped his lips when twice he had seen him fall to the earth. Only he turned paler and his limbs trembled. But he had uttered one low cry when he saw him victorious. Unconscious, alas, of the more fearful battle to which the victory was but a prelude. My gallant boy, said he and wiped his eyes. Is he thy son? said a brawny fellow to the right of the Nazarene. He has fought well. Let us see how he does by and by. Hark, he is to fight the first victor. Now, old boy, pray the gods that that victor be neither of the Romans, nor next to them the giant Niger. The old man sat down again and covered his face. The fray for the moment was indifferent to him. Leiden was not one of the combatants. Yet, yet, the thought flashed across him, the fray was indeed of deadly interest. The first who fell was to make way for Leiden. He started and bent down, with straining eyes and clasped hands, to view the encounter. The first interest was attracted towards the combat of Niger with Sporus, for this species of contest, from the fatal result which usually attended it, and from the great science it required in either antagonist, was always peculiarly inviting to the spectators. They stood at a considerable distance from each other. The singular helmet which Sporus wore, the visor of which was down, concealed his face, but the features of Niger attracted a fearful and universal interest from their compressed and vigilant ferocity. Thus they stood for some moments, each eyeing each, till Sporus began slowly and with great caution to advance, holding his sword pointed like a modern fencer's at the breast of his foe. Niger retreated as his antagonist advanced, gathering up his net with his right hand, and never taking his small glittering eye from the movements of the swordsman. Suddenly, when Sporius had approached nearly at arm's length, the retiarius threw himself forward and cast his net. A quick inflection of body saved the gladiator from the deadly snare. He uttered a sharp cry of joy and rage and rushed upon Niger but Niger had already drawn in his net, thrown it across his shoulders, 
and now fled round the lists with a swiftness which the secutor in vain endeavoured to equal. The people laughed and shouted aloud, to see the ineffectual efforts of the broad-shouldered gladiator to overtake the flying giant. When, at that moment, their attention was turned from these to the two Roman combatants. They had placed themselves at the onset face to face, at the distance of modern fencers from each other. But the extreme caution which both evinced at first had prevented any warmth of engagement, and allowed the spectators full leisure to interest themselves in the battle between Sporus and his foe. But the Romans were now heated into full and fierce encounter. They pushed, returned, advanced on, retreated from each other with all that careful yet scarcely perceptible caution which characterizes men well experienced and equally matched. But at this moment, Eumolpus, the elder gladiator, by that dexterous backstroke which was considered in the arena so difficult to avoid, had wounded Nepomus in the side. The people shouted. Lepidus turned pale. Ho! said Clodius. The game is nearly over. If Eumolpus fights now the quiet fight, the other will gradually bleed himself away. But, thank the gods, he has not fight the backward fight. See, he presses hard upon Nepomus. By Mars, but Nepomus had him there. The helmet rang again. Clodius, I shall win. Why do I ever bet but at the dice? groaned Clodius to himself. Or why cannot one cog a gladiator? Asporus, Asporus, shouted the populace, as Niger, having now suddenly paused, had again cast his net, and again unsuccessfully. He had not retreated this time with sufficient agility. The sword of Sporus had inflicted a severe wound upon his right leg, and, incapacitated to fly, he was pressed hard by the fierce swordsman. His great height and length of arm still continued, however, to give him no despicable advantages, and steadily keeping his trident at the front of his foe, he repelled him successfully for several minutes. Sporus now tried, by great rapidity of evolution, to get round his antagonist, who necessarily moved with pain and slowness. In so doing, he lost his caution. He advanced too near to the giant, raised his arm to strike, and received the three points of the fatal spear full in his breast. He sank on his knee. In a moment more, the deadly net was cast over him. He struggled against its meshes in vain. Again, again, again he writhed mutely beneath the fresh strokes of the trident. His blood flowed fast through the net and redly over the sand. He lowered his arms in acknowledgment of defeat. The conquering Retiarius withdrew his net, and leaning on his spear, looked to the audience for their judgment. Slowly, too, at the same moment, the vanquished gladiator rolled his dim and despairing eyes around the theater. From row to row, from bench to bench, there glared upon him but merciless and unpitying eyes. Hushed was the roar, the murmur. The silence was dread, for it was no sympathy. Not a hand, no, not even a woman's hand, gave the signal of charity and life. Sporus had never been popular in the arena, and lately the interest of the combatant had been excited on behalf of the wounded Niger. The people were warmed into blood. The mimic fight had ceased to charm. The interest had mounted up to the desire of sacrifice and the thirst of death. The gladiator felt that his doom was sealed. He uttered no prayer, no groan. The people gave the signal of death. In dogged but agonized submission, he bent his neck to receive the fatal stroke. And now, as the spear of the Retarius was not a weapon to inflict instant and certain death, there stalked into the arena a grim and fatal form, brandishing a short, sharp sword, and with features utterly concealed beneath his visor. With slow and measured steps, this dismal headsman approached the gladiator, still kneeling, laid the left hand on his humbled crest, drew the edge of the blade across his neck, turned round to the assembly, lest in the last moment remorse should come upon them. The dread signal continued the same. The blade glittered brightly in the air, fell, and the gladiator rolled upon the sand, 
his limbs quivered, were still. He was a corpse. His body was dragged at once from the arena through the gate of death, and thrown into the gloomy den termed technically the spoliarium. And ere it had well reached that destination, the strife between the remaining combatants was decided. The sword of Eumolpus had inflicted the death wound upon the less experienced combatant. A new victim was added to the receptacle of the slain. Throughout that mighty assembly there now ran a universal movement. The people breathed more freely, and resettled themselves in their seats. A grateful shower was cast over every row from the concealed conduits. In cool and luxurious pleasure they talked over the late spectacle of blood. Eumolpus removed his helmet and wiped his brows. His close curled hair and short beard, his noble Roman features and bright dark eye, attracted the general admiration. He was fresh, unwounded, unfatigued. The editor paused and proclaimed aloud that, as Niger's wound disabled him from again entering the arena, Leiden was to be the successor to the slaughtered Nepimus, and the new combatant of Eumolpus. Yet Leiden, added he, if thou wouldst decline the combat with one so brave and tried, thou mayst have full liberty to do so. Eumolpus is not the antagonist that was originally decreed for thee. Thou knowest best how far thou canst cope with him. If thou failest, thy doom is honorable death. If thou conquerest, out of my own purse I will double the stipulated prize. The people shouted applause. Leiden stood in the lists. He gazed around. High above he beheld the pale face, the straining eyes of his father. He turned away irresolute for a moment. No, the conquest of the Cestus was not sufficient. He had not yet won the prize of victory. His father was still a slave. Noble ideale, he replied in a firm and deep tone, I shrink not from this combat. For the honor of Pompey, I demand that one trained by its long-celebrated Lanista shall do battle with this Roman. The people shouted louder than before. Four to one against Leiden, said Clodius to Lepidus. I would not take twenty to one. Why, Eumolpus is a very Achilles, and this poor fellow is but a Tyro. Eumolpus gazed hard at the face of Leiden. He smiled, yet the smile was followed by a slight and scarce audible sigh, a touch of compassionate emotion, which custom conquered the moment the heart acknowledged it. And now both, clad in complete armor, the sword drawn, the visor closed, the two last combatants of the arena, ere man at least was matched with beast, stood opposed to each other. It was just at this time that a letter was delivered to the praetor by one of the attendants of the arena. He removed the cincture, glanced over it for a moment. His countenance betrayed surprise and embarrassment. He re-read the letter, and then muttering, Tush, it is impossible. The man must be drunk even in the morning to dream of such follies. Threw it carelessly aside, and gravely settled himself once more in the attitude of attention to the sports. The interest of the public was wound up very high. Eumolpus had at first won their favor, but the gallantry of Leiden, and his well-timed allusion to the honor of the Pompeian Lanista, had afterwards given the latter the preference in their eyes. Hola, old fellow, said Medan's neighbor to him, your son is hardly matched, but never fear, the editor will not permit him to be slain, no, nor the people neither, he has behaved too bravely for that. Ha, that was a home thrust, well averted by Pollux, at him again, Leiden. They stopped to breathe, what art thou muttering, old boy? prayers answered medan with a more calm and hopeful mien than he had yet maintained prayers trifles the time for gods to carry a man away in a cloud is gone now ha jupiter what a blow thy side thy side take care of thy side leiden there was a compulsive tremor throughout the assembly a fierce blow from eumolpus full on the crest had brought leiden to his knee have it! He has it! cried a shrill female voice. He has it! 
It was the voice of the girl who had so anxiously anticipated the sacrifice of some criminal to the beasts. "'Be silent, child,' said the wife of Panza haughtily. "'Non have it. He is not wounded.' "'I wish he were, if only to spite old surly Meaden,' muttered the girl. Meanwhile Leiden, who had hitherto defended himself with great skill and valor, began to give way before the vigorous assaults of the practiced Roman. His arm grew tired, his eye dizzy, he breathed hard and painfully. The combatants paused again for breath. "'Young man,' said Eumolpus, in a low voice, "'desist. I will wound thee slightly, then lower thy arms. Thou hast propitiated the editor and the mob. Thou wilt be honorably saved.' and my father still enslaved, groaned Leiden to himself. No, death or his freedom. At that thought, and seeing that his strength not being equal to the endurance of the Roman, everything depended on a sudden and desperate effort, he threw himself fiercely on Eumolpus. The Roman warily retreated. Leiden thrust again. Eumolpus drew himself aside. The sword grazed his cuirass. Leiden's breast was exposed. The Roman plunged his sword through the joints of the armor, not meaning, however, to inflict a deep wound. Leiden, weak and exhausted, fell forward, fell right on the point. It passed through and through, even to the back. Eumolpus drew forth his blade. Leiden still made an effort to regain his balance. His sword left his grasp. He struck mechanically at the gladiator with his naked hand and fell prostrate on the arena. With one accord, editor and assembly made the signal of mercy. The officers of the arena approached. They took off the helmet of the vanquished. He still breathed. His eyes rolled fiercely on his foe. The savageness he had acquired in his calling glared from his gaze and lowered upon the brow darkened already with the shades of death. Then, with a convulsive groan, with a half start, he lifted his eyes above. They rested not on the face of the editor, nor on the pitying brows of his relenting judges. He saw them not. They were as if the vast space was desolate and bare. One pale agonizing face alone was all he recognized. One cry of a broken heart was all that, amidst the murmurs and the shouts of the populace, reached his ear. The ferocity vanished from his brow. A soft, a tender expression of sanctifying but despairing love played over his features, played, waned, darkened. His face suddenly became locked and rigid, resuming its former fierceness. He fell upon the earth. Look to him, said the ideale. He has done his duty. The officers dragged him off to the spoliarium. A true type of glory and of its fate, murmured Arbaces to himself and his eye, glancing round the amphitheatre, betrayed so much of disdain and scorn that whoever encountered it felt his breath suddenly arrested, and his emotions frozen into one sensation of abasement and of awe. Again rich perfumes were wafted around the theatre. The attendants sprinkled fresh sand over the arena. "'Bring forth the lion and Glaucus the Athenian,' said the editor." and a deep and breathless hush of overwrought interest, and intense, yet strange to say not unpleasing, terror lay, like a mighty and awful dream, over the assembly. End of Book 5, Chapter 2《Book Five, Chapter Three, of Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer Lytton. Book Five, Chapter Three. Sallust and Nidia's Letter. Thrice had Sallust awakened from his morning sleep and thrice, recollecting that his friend was that day to perish, had he turned himself with a deep sigh once more to court oblivion. His sole object in life was to avoid pain, 
and where he could not avoid at least to forget it. At length, unable any longer to steep his consciousness in slumber, he raised himself from his incumbent posture, and discovered his favourite freedman sitting by his bedside as usual, for Sallust, who, as I have said, had a gentleman-like taste for the polite letters, was accustomed to be read to for an hour or so previous to his rising in the morning. "'No books to-day, no more Tibullus, no more Pindar for me, Pinda, alas, alas! The very name recalls those games to which our arena is the savage successor. Has it begun, the amphitheatre? Are its rites commenced? Long since, O Sallust, did you not hear the trumpets and the trampling feet? Ay, ay, but the gods be thanked, I was drowsy, and had only to turn round to fall asleep again. The gladiators must have been long in the ring. The wretches! None of my people have gone to the spectacle. Assuredly not. Your orders were too strict. That is well. Would the day were over. What is that letter yonder on the table? That? Oh, the letter brought to you last night, when you were too, uh, too... Drunk to read it, I suppose. No matter, it cannot be of much importance. Shall I open it for you, Sallust? Do. Anything to divert my thoughts. Poor Glaucus. The freedman opened the letter. What? Greek? said he. Some learned lady, I suppose. He glanced over the letter, and for some moments the irregular lines traced by the blind girl's hand puzzled him. Suddenly, however, his countenance exhibited emotion and surprise. Good gods, noble Sallust! What have we done not to attend to this before? Hear me read. Nidia, the slave, to Sallust, the friend of Glaucus. I am a prisoner in the house of Arbaces. Hasten to the praetor, procure my release, and we shall yet save Glaucus from the lion. There is another prisoner within these walls, whose witness can exonerate the Athenian from the charge against him, one who saw the crime, who can prove the criminal in a villain hitherto unsuspected. Fly, hasten, quick, quick! Bring with you armed men, lest resistance be made, and a cunning and dexterous smith, for the dungeon of my fellow prisoner is thick and strong. O oh, by thy right hand, and thy father's ashes, lose not a moment! Great Joe! exclaimed Salus, starting. And this day, nay, within this hour perhaps he dies. What is to be done? I will instantly to the praetor. Nay, not so. The praetor, as well as Pansa, the editor himself, is the creature of the mob, and the mob will not hear of delay. They will not be balked in the very moment of expectation. Besides, the publicity of the appeal would forewarn the cunning Egyptian. It is evident that he has some interest in these concealments. No, fortunately thy slaves are in thy house. I see the meaning, interrupted Sallust. Arm the slaves instantly. The streets are empty. We will ourselves hasten to the house of Arbaces and release the prisoners. Quick, quick! What ho! Thou was there. My gown and sandals, the papyrus and the reed. I will write to the praetor to beseech him to delay the sentence of Glaucus, for that within an hour we may yet prove him innocent. So, so that is well. Hasten with this Davus to the praetor at the amphitheatre. See it given to his own hand. Now then, O ye gods, whose providence Epicurus denied, befriend me, and I will call Epicurus a liar. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of the Last Days of Pompeii. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last Days of Pompeii by Edward G. Bulwer-Lytton. Book 5, Chapter 4. The Amphitheatre Once More. Glaucus and Olynthus had been placed together in that gloomy and narrow cell in which the criminals of the arena awaited their last and fearful struggle. Their eyes, of late accustomed to the darkness, 
scanned the faces of each other in this awful hour, and by that dim light, the paleness, which chased away the natural hues from either cheek, assumed a yet more ashy and ghastly whiteness. Yet their brows were erect and dauntless, their limbs did not tremble, their lips were compressed and rigid. The religion of the one, the pride of the other, the conscious innocence of both, and, it may be, the support derived from their mutual companionship, elevated the victim into the hero. Hark, hearest thou that shout? They are growling over their human blood, said Olynthus. I hear. My heart grows sick. But the gods support me. The gods? O oh, rash young man! In this hour recognize only the one god. Have I not taught thee in the dungeon, wept for thee, prayed for thee? In my zeal and in my agony, have I not thought more of thy salvation than my own? Brave friend, answered Glaucus solemnly, I have listened to thee with awe, with wonder, and with a secret tendency towards conviction. Had our lives been spared, I might gradually have weaned myself from the tenets of my own faith, and inclined to thine. But, in this last hour, it were a craven thing, and a base, to yield to hasty terror what should only be the result of lengthened meditation. Were I to embrace thy creed, and cast down my father's gods, should I not be bribed by thy promise of heaven, or awed by thy threats of hell? Olynthus, no. Think we of each other with equal charity, I honoring thy sincerity, thou pitying my blindness or my obdurate courage. As have been my deeds, such will be my reward, and the power or powers above will not judge harshly of human error, when it is linked with honesty of purpose and truth of heart. Speak we no more of this. Hush! Dost thou hear them drag yon heavy body through the passage? such as that clay will be ours soon. O heaven! O Christ! Already I behold ye! cried the fervent Olynthus, lifting up his hands. I tremble not! I rejoice that the prison house shall soon be broken! Glaucus bowed his head in silence. He felt the distinction between his fortitude and that of his fellow sufferer. The heathen did not tremble, but the Christian exulted. The door swung gratingly back, the gleam of spears shot along the walls. Glaucus the Athenian, thy time has come, said a loud and clear voice. The lion awaits thee. I am ready, said the Athenian. Brother and co-mate, one last embrace. Bless me and farewell. The Christian opened his arms. He clasped the young heathen to his breast. He kissed his forehead and cheek. He sobbed aloud. His tears flowed fast and hot over the features of his new friend. Oh, could I have converted thee, I had not wept. Oh, that I might say to thee, We too shall sup this night in paradise. It may be so yet, answered the Greek, with a tremulous voice. They whom death part not may meet yet beyond the grave. On the earth, on the beautiful, the beloved earth, farewell forever. Worthy officer, I attend you. Glaucus tore himself away, and when he came forth into the air, its breath, which, though sunless, was hot and arid, smote witheringly upon him. His frame, not yet restored from the effects of the deadly draught, shrank and trembled. The officers supported him. Courage, said one, thou art young, active, well-knit. They give thee a weapon, despair not, and thou mayest yet conquer. Glaucus did not reply, but, ashamed of his infirmity, he made a desperate and convulsive effort, and regained the firmness of his nerves. They anointed his body, completely naked, save by a cincture round his loins, placed a stylus, vain weapon, in his hand, and led him into the arena. And now, when the Greek saw the eyes of thousands and tens of thousands upon him, he no longer felt that he was mortal. All evidence of fear, all fear itself was gone. A red and haughty flush spread over the paleness of his features. He towered aloft to the full of his glorious stature. In the elastic beauty of his limbs and form, in his intent but unfrowning brow, in the high disdain, 
and in the indomitable soul, which breathed visibly, which spoke audibly, from his attitude, his lip, his eye, he seemed the very incarnation, vivid and corporeal, of the valor of his land, of the divinity of its worship, at once a hero and a god. The murmur of hatred and horror at his crime, which had greeted his entrance, died into the silence of involuntary admiration and half-compassionate respect, and with a quick and convulsive sigh that seemed to move the whole mass of life as if it were one body, the gaze of the spectators turned from the Athenian to a dark, uncouth object in the center of the arena. It was the grated den of the lion. "'By Venus, how warm it is,' said Fulvia. "'Yet there is no sun. Would that those stupid sailors could have fastened up that gap in the awning.' "'Oh, it is warm, indeed. I turn sick, I faint,' said the wife of Panza even her experienced stoicism giving way at the struggle about to take place. The lion had been kept without food for twenty-four hours, and the animal had, during the whole morning, testified a singular and restless uneasiness, which the keeper had attributed to the pangs of hunger. Yet its bearing seemed rather that of fear than of rage. Its roar was painful and distressed. It hung its head, snuffed the air through the bars, then lay down, started again, and again uttered its wild and far-resounding cries. And now, in its den, it lay utterly dumb and mute, with distended nostrils forced hard against the grating, and disturbing with a heaving breath the sand below on the arena. The editor's lip quivered, his cheek grew pale, he looked anxiously around, hesitated, delayed. The crowd became impatient. Slowly he gave the sign. The keeper, who was behind the den, cautiously removed the grating, and the lion leaped forth with a mighty and glad roar of release. The keeper hastily retreated through the grated passage leading from the arena, and left the lord of the forest and his prey. Glaucus had bent his limbs so as to give himself the firmest posture at the expected rush of the lion, with his small and shining weapon raised on high, in the faint hope that one well-directed thrust, for he knew that he should have time for but one, might penetrate through the eye to the brain of his grim foe. But, to the unalterable astonishment of all, the beast seemed not even aware of the presence of the criminal. At the first moment of its release it halted abruptly in the arena. It raised itself half on end, snuffing the upward air with impatient sighs. Then suddenly it sprang forward, but not on the Athenian. At half-speed it circled round and round the space, turning its vast head from side to side with an anxious and perturbed gaze, as if seeking only some avenue of escape. Once or twice it endeavored to leap up the parapet that divided it from the audience, and, on failing, uttered rather a baffled howl than its deep-toned and kingly roar. It evinced no sign, either of wrath or hunger. Its tail drooped along the sand, instead of lashing its gaunt sides, and its eye, though it wandered at times to Glaucus, rolled again listlessly from him. At length, as if tired of attempting to escape, it crept with a moan into its cage, and once more laid itself down to rest. The first surprise of the assembly at the apathy of the lion soon grew converted into resentment at its cowardice and the populace already merged their pity for the fate of Glaucus into angry compassion for their own disappointment. The editor called to the keeper, How is this? Take the goad, prick him forth, and then close the door of the den. As the keeper, with some fear but more astonishment, was preparing to obey, a loud cry was heard at one of the entrances of the arena. There was a confusion, a bustle, voices of remonstrance suddenly breaking forth, and suddenly silenced at the reply. All eyes turned in wonder at the interruption, towards the quarter of the disturbance. The crowd gave way, and suddenly Sallust appeared on the senatorial benches, his hair disheveled, breathless, heated, half exhausted. He cast his eyes hastily round the ring. "'Remove the Athenian!' he cried. "'Haste! He is innocent!' Arrest Arbaces the Egyptian, he is the murderer of Apicides. Art thou mad, O Sallust? 
said the praetor, rising from his seat. What means this raving? Remove the Athenian, quick, or his blood be on your head. Praetor, delay, and you answer with your own life to the emperor. I bring with me the eyewitness to the death of the priest Apicides. Room there, stand back, give way, people of Pompeii, fix every eye upon Arbaces, there he sits. Room there for the priest Calenus. Pale, haggard, fresh from the jaws of famine and of death, his face fallen, his eyes dull as a vulture's, his broad frame gaunt as a skeleton. Calenus was supported into the very row in which Arbaces sat. His releasers had given him sparingly of food, but the chief sustenance that nerved his feeble limbs was revenge. The priest Calenus! Calenus! cried the mob. Is it he? No, it is a dead man. It is the priest Calenus, said the praetor gravely. What hast thou to say? Arbaces of Egypt is the murder of Apicides the priest of Isis. These eyes saw him deal the blow. It is from the dungeon into which he plunged me, it is from the darkness and horror of a death by famine, that the gods have raised me to proclaim his crime. Release the Athenian, he is innocent. It is for this, then, that the lion spared him. A miracle! A miracle! cried Panza. A miracle! A miracle! shouted the people. Remove the Athenian! Arbaces to the lion! And that shout echoed from hill to vale, from coast to sea. Arbaces to the lion! Officers, remove the accused Glaucus. Remove, but guard him yet, said the praetor. The gods lavish their wonders upon this day. As the praetor gave the word of release, there was a cry of joy, a female voice, a child's voice, and it was of joy. It rang through the heart of the assembly with electric force. It was touching. It was holy, that child's voice. And the populace echoed it back with sympathizing congratulation. Silence, said the grave praetor. Who is there? The blind girl, Nydia, answered Sallust. It is her hand that has raised Calenus from the grave and delivered Glaucus from the lion. Of this hereafter, said the praetor. Calenus, priest of Isis, thou accusest Arbaces of the murder of Apicides? I do. Thou didst behold the deed? Praetor, with these eyes. Enough at present. The details must be reserved for more suiting time and place. Arbaces of Egypt, thou hearest the charge against thee. Thou hast not yet spoken. What hast thou to say? The gaze of the crowd had long been riveted on Arbaces, but not until the confusion which he had betrayed at the first charge of Sallust and the entrance of Calenus had subsided. At the shout, Arbaces to the lion, he had indeed trembled, and the dark bronze of his cheek had taken a paler hue, but he had soon recovered his haughtiness and self-control. Proudly he returned the angry glare of the countless eyes around him, and replying now, to the question of the praetor, he said, in that accent so peculiarly tranquil and commanding, which characterized his tones, Praetor, this charge is so mad that it scarcely deserves reply. My first accuser is the noble Sallust, the most intimate friend of Glaucus. My second is a priest. I revere his garb and calling. But, people of Pompeii, ye know somewhat of the character of Calenus. He is gripping and gold-thirsty to a proverb. The witness of such men is to be bought. Praetor, I am innocent. Sallust, said the magistrate, where found you Calenus? In the dungeons of Arbaces. Egyptian, said the praetor, frowning, thou didst then dare to imprison a priest of the gods? And wherefore? Hear me, answered Arbaces, rising calmly, but with agitation visible on his face. This man came to threaten that he would make against me the charge he has now made, unless I would purchase his silence with half my fortune. I remonstrated, in vain. Peace there, let not the priest interrupt me. Noble praetor, and ye, O people, I was a stranger in the land, I knew myself innocent of crime. But the witness of a priest against me might yet destroy me. In my perplexity I decoyed him into the cell whence he had been released. 
on the pretense that it was the coffer-house of my gold. I resolved to detain him there until the fate of the true criminal was sealed, and his threats could avail no longer. But I meant no worse. I may have erred, but who amongst ye will not acknowledge the equity of self-preservation? Were I guilty, why was the witness of this priest silent at the trial? Then I had not detained or concealed him. Why did he not proclaim my guilt when I proclaimed that of Glaucus? Praetor, this needs an answer. For the rest, I throw myself on your laws. I demand their protection. Remove hence the accused and the accuser. I will willingly meet, and cheerfully abide by, the decision of the legitimate tribunal. This is no place for further parley. He says right, said the praetor. Ho, guards, remove Arbaces. Guard Calenus. Sallust, we hold you responsible for your accusation. Let the sports be resumed. What? cried Calenus, turning round to the people. Shall Isis be thus contemned? Shall the blood of Apicides yet cry for vengeance? Shall justice be delayed now, that it may be frustrated hereafter? Shall the lion be cheated of his lawful prey? A god! A god! I feel the god rush to my lips. To the lion! To the lion with Arbaces! His exhausted frame could support no longer the ferocious malice of the priest. He sank on the ground in strong convulsions. The foam gathered to his mouth. He was as a man, indeed, whom a supernatural power had entered. People saw and shuddered. It is a god that inspires the holy man. To the lion with the Egyptian! With that cry up sprang, on moved, thousands upon thousands. They rushed from the heights. They poured down in the direction of the Egyptian. In vain did the Edile command. In vain did the Praetor lift his voice and proclaim the law. The people had been already rendered savage by the exhibition of blood. They thirsted for more. Their superstition was aided by their ferocity. Aroused, inflamed by the spectacle of their victims, they forgot the authority of their rulers. It was one of those dread popular convulsions common to crowds wholly ignorant, half free and half servile, and which the peculiar constitution of the Roman provinces so frequently exhibited. The power of the praetor was as a reed beneath the whirlwind. Still, at his word the guards had drawn themselves along the lower benches, on which the upper classes sat separate from the vulgar. They made but a feeble barrier. The waves of the human sea halted for a moment, to enable Arbaces to count the exact moment of his doom. In despair, and in a terror which beat down even pride, he glanced his eyes over the rolling and rushing crowd, when, right above them, through the wide chasm which had been left in the Valeria, he beheld a strange and awful apparition. He beheld, and his craft restored his courage. He stretched his hand on high. Over his lofty brow and royal features there came an expression of unutterable solemnity and command. Behold! he shouted with a voice of thunder, which stilled the roar of the crowd. Behold how the gods protect the guiltless! The fires of the avenging Orcus burst forth against the false witness of my accusers. The eyes of the crowd followed the gesture of the Egyptian, and beheld, with ineffable dismay, a vast vapor shooting from the summit of Vesuvius, in the form of a gigantic pine tree, the trunk blackness, the branches fire, a fire that shifted and wavered in its hues with every moment, now fiercely luminous, now of a dull and dying red, that again blazed terrifically forth with intolerable glare. There was a dead, heart-sunken silence, through which there suddenly broke the roar of the lion which was echoed back from within the building by the sharper and fiercer yells of its fellow beast. Dread seers were they of the burden of the atmosphere, and the wild prophets of the wrath to come. Then there arose on high the universal shrieks of women. The men stared at each other, but were dumb. At that moment they felt the earth shake beneath their feet, the walls of the theatre trembled, and, beyond in the distance, they heard the crash of falling roofs. An instant more and the mountain clouds seemed to roll towards them, dark and rapid, like a torrent. At the same time it cast forth from its bosom a shower of ashes mixed with vast fragments of burning stone. 
over the crushing vines, over the desolate streets, over the amphitheater itself, far and wide, with many a mighty splash in the agitated sea, fell that awful shower. No longer thought the crowd of justice or of arbaces. Safety for themselves was their sole thought. Each turned to fly, each dashing, pressing, crushing against the other, trampling recklessly over the fallen, amidst groans and oaths and prayers and sudden shrieks. The enormous crowd vomited itself forth through the numerous passages. Whither should they fly? Some, anticipating a second earthquake, hastened to their homes to load themselves with their more costly goods, and escape while it was yet time. Others, dreading the showers of ashes that now fell fast, torrent upon torrent, over the streets, rushed under the roofs of the nearest houses, or temples, or sheds, shelter of any kind, for protection from the terrors of the open air. But darker, and larger, and mightier, spread the cloud above them. It was a sudden and more ghastly night rushing upon the realm of noon. End of Book 5, Chapter 4five chapter five of the last days of pompeii this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the last days of pompeii by edward g bulwer lytton book five chapter five the cell of the prisoner and the den of the dead grief unconscious of horror Stunned by his reprieve, doubting that he was awake, Glaucus had been led by the officers of the arena into a small cell within the walls of the theatre. They threw a loose robe over his form, and crowded round in congratulation and wonder. There was an impatient and fretful cry without the cell. The throng gave way, and the blind girl, led by some gentler hand, flung herself at the feet of Glaucus. It was I who have saved thee, she sobbed. Now let me die. Nydia, my child, my preserver. Oh, let me feel thy touch, thy breath. Yes, yes, thou livest. We are not too late. That dread door, he thought it would never yield. And Calenus, oh, his voice was as the dying wind among tombs. We had to wait. Gods, it seemed hours ere food and wine restored to him something of strength. But thou livest, thou livest yet, and I, I have saved thee. This affecting scene was soon interrupted by the event just described. The mountain, the earthquake, resounded from side to side. The officers fled with the rest. They left Glaucus and Nydia to save themselves as they might. As the sense of the dangers around them flashed on the Athenian, his generous heart recurred to Olynthus. He, too, was reprieved from the tiger by the hand of the gods. Should he be left to a no less fatal death in the neighboring cell? Taking Nydia by the hand, Glaucus hurried across the passages. He gained the den of the Christian. He found Olynthus kneeling and in prayer. Arise, arise, my friend, he cried. Save thyself and fly. See, nature is thy dread deliverer. He led forth the bewildered Christian, and pointed to the cloud which advanced darker and darker, disgorging forth showers of ashes and pumice stones, and bade him hearken to the cries and trampling rush of the scattered crowd. This is the hand of God. God be praised, said Olynthus devoutly. Fly, seek thy brethren. Concert with them thy escape. Farewell. Olynthus did not answer, neither did he mark the retreating form of his friend. High thoughts and solemn absorbed his soul, and in the enthusiasm of his kindling heart he exulted in the mercy of God rather than trembled at the evidence of his power. At length he roused himself, and hurried on. He scarce knew whither. The open doors of a dark, desolate cell suddenly appeared on his path. Through the gloom within there flared and flickered a single lamp, and by its light he saw three grim and naked forms stretched on the earth in death. His feet were suddenly arrested, for, amidst the terror of that drear recess, 
the spolarium of the arena, he heard a low voice calling on the name of Christ. He could not resist lingering at that appeal. He entered the den, and his feet were dabbled in the slow streams of blood that gushed from the corpses over the sand. Who, said the Nazarene, calls upon the Son of God? No answer came forth, and turning round, Olynthus beheld, by the light of the lamp, an old, grey-headed man sitting on the floor, and supporting in his lap the head of one of the dead. The features of the dead man were firmly and rigidly locked in the last sleep, but over the lip there played a fierce smile, not the Christian's smile of hope, but the dark sneer of hatred and defiance. Yet on the face still lingered the beautiful roundness of early youth. The hair curled thick and glossy over the unwrinkled brow, and the down of manhood but slightly shaded the marble of the hueless cheek. And over this face bent one of such unutterable sadness, of such yearning tenderness, of such fawn and such deep despair. The tears of the old man fell fast and hot, but he did not feel them, and when his lips moved, and he mechanically uttered the prayer of his benign and hopeful faith, neither his heart nor his sense responded to the words. It was but the involuntary emotion that broke from the lethargy of his mind. His boy was dead, and had died for him, and the old man's heart was broken. Medan, said Olynthus, pityingly, arise and fly. God is forth upon the wings of the elements. The new Gomorrah is doomed. Fly, ere the fires consume thee. He was ever so full of life. He cannot be dead. Come hither. Place your hand on his heart. Sure it beats yet? Brother, the soul has fled. We will remember it in our prayers. Thou canst not reanimate the dumb clay. Come, come. Hark while I speak, yon crashing walls. Hark, yon agonizing cries. Not a moment is to be lost. Come. I hear nothing, said Medan, shaking his gray hair. The poor boy, his love murdered him. Come, come, forgive this friendly force. What? Who would sever the father from the son? And Medan clasped the body tightly in his embrace, and covered it with passionate kisses. Go, said he, lifting up his face for one moment. Go, we must be alone. Alas, said the compassionate Nazarene, death has severed ye already. The old man smiled very calmly. No, 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 muttered, his voice growing lower with each word. Death has been more kind. With that his head drooped to his son's breast, his arms relaxed their grasp. Olynthus caught him by the hand. The pulse had ceased to beat. The last words of the father were the words of truth. Death had been more kind. Meanwhile, Glaucus and Nydia were pacing swiftly up the perilous and fearful streets. The Athenian had learned from his preserver that Ione was yet in the house of Arbaces. Thither he fled, to release, to save her. The few slaves whom the Egyptian had left at his mansion when he had repaired in the long procession to the amphitheatre had been able to offer no resistance to the armed band of Sallust, and when afterwards the volcano broke forth, they huddled together, stunned and frightened, in the inmost recesses of the house. Even the tall Ethiopian had forsaken his post at the door, and Glaucus, who left Nydia without, the poor Nydia, jealous once more, even in such an hour, passed on through the vast hall without meeting one from whom to learn the chamber of Ione. Even as he passed, however, the darkness that covered the heavens increased so rapidly that it was with difficulty that he could guide his steps. The flower-wreathed columns seemed to reel and tremble, and with every instant he heard the ashes fall cranchingly into the roofless peristyle. He ascended to the upper rooms. Breathless he paced along, shouting out aloud the name of Ione, and at length he heard, at the end of a gallery, a voice, her voice, in wondering reply. To rush forward, to shatter the door, to seize Ione in his arms, to hurry from the mansion, seemed to him the work of an instant. Scarce had he gained the spot where Nydia was, 
Then he heard the steps advancing towards the house, and recognized the voice of Arbaces, who had returned to seek his wealth and Ione ere he fled from the doomed Pompeii. But so dense was already the reeking atmosphere, that the foes saw not each other, though so near, save that, dimly in the gloom, Glaucus caught the moving outline of the snowy robes of the Egyptian. They hastened onward, those three. Alas, whither? They now saw not a step before them. The blackness became utter. They were encompassed with doubt and horror, and the death he had escaped seemed to Glaucus only to have changed its form and augmented its victims. End of Book 5, Chapter 5